After returning home from the army, a young man starts to bartend to make ends meet while attending college. Before he knows it, he starts to become more involved in the water bartending, which apparently is more seedy than I thought, while potentially meeting the love of his life. Hello, everyone. I'm Caleb Blaget. I'm Connor Zagari. Welcome to a new episode of Beyond the Bad. <laughs> all right today we will be talking about 1988 yeah 1988 tom cruise starring cocktail why? Because Top Gun Maverick's coming out this weekend, and I don't give two fucks about it, and neither does Connor. <laughs> so what better way to celebrate? Uh, yep, yeah, this will be fun to kind of take Tom Cruise to task, like, like we don't fucking do that all the time, but this time in a way more personal way. Yes. <laughs> this. This particular film, though, which you're probably thinking, why not Top Gun? Why not the first one? Because it technically, critically, would fit in this show. Commercially, God, no, because people fucking lose their mind over it. But I don't want to watch it. And I thought it'd be funnier just to pick something outside of Top Gun. (laughs) So here we are. (laughs) I think this was his follow-up to Top Gun. That's what I'm talking God, I'm good. (laughs) I honestly didn't know that. I just picked this one. (laughs) This was like two years later. Oh, God. <laughs> um, with that said, though, kind of like Top Gun, actually, this film was a pretty fucking big su- box office success. Made lots of money. Um, but it would get destroyed by critics, which then leads to a nice little segue to the scores for you. Oh, yeah. Cocktail, not a celebrated cult classic. 7%. Uh <laughs> Rotten Tomatoes score. That is out of only 44 reviews, but still. And a 58% audience score, which is over 100,000 ratings. So, yeah, this is a pretty universally panned film, despite being a box office success. I don't think Tom Cruise has dealt with a lot of box office failure in his career. Like, since the beginning, this dude's had just constant successes. I can't name a film off the top of my head that's actually been a bomb that he's been in. Yeah, it's really kind of amazing. Um, Here's the critics consensus. There are no surprises in Cocktail, a shallow, dramatically inert romance that squanders Tom Cruise's talents in what amounts to a naive barkeep's banal fantasy. That's pretty accurate. Actually, yeah, I kind of agree with that for once. Usually I'm like, that's a little harsh. This one, like, <laughs> that kind of fits with the movie I watched. Yeah, pretty much. This is the constant, you know, secret of my success shit in this movie. It's just like, it makes you want to be a bartender and then realize, like, no, this is not going to happen to you. It's not all just flipping cups and hooking up with rich chicks. That's not bartending. Not, no. No, it's not. The The only time they did a bartending movie that was just fucking out there and was surprisingly true is when they did Coyote Ugly because those bars actually exist. There, <laughs> I have seen one in San Diego. When I was in station up in Washington, we would go down to San Diego to pick up um, crew members for the boat. Um in the gas lamp district downtown fucking i don't know how it looks now post pandemic but pre-pandemic um big ass sign everything it was on the corner huge coyote ugly like it they were very proud of that bar so but that was based off a fucking bar that actually exists or i I think became i don't know it existed after film either way that's the only one that did wild, crazy shit in the movie that actually reflects what I've heard about the actual bar in real life. Um, but this, God, no. There's not a TGI Fridays on Earth that is this exciting. Never has been. <laughs> no. And let me tell you, like, if a bartender is doing all, like, so I, I don't know if you've ever seen it on, uh, if you have Paramount Plus and you're looking for some just trashy, mind-numbing just turn your brain off like reality tv watch ball rescue i have seen i've seen a couple episodes of that yeah if you look if you just want to waste some time and laugh based off that show 
yeah, if you're trying to flip bottles, I don't want you serving me alcohol. Like, I just want the fucking alcohol, not your goddamn tricks. Give me what I ordered. Stop flipping the bottle around. <laughs> oh my god! It's not hibachi. Like, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! I wonder how many shitty bartenders are out there because of this movie. Oh, like, god. how many people were like, "I want to do that," and then got hired and just flipped bottles, and people were like, "Where the fuck's my beer?" <laughs> Constantly. Yeah, like, what do you do when they ask for something on on tap? You know what I mean? Like, don't flip the bottle. Just put it on the goddamn tap and pull the lever. <laughs> and then hand it to me. <laughs> oh, yeah. This painted a an unrealistic picture of this profession for America for quite some time. And if you want a realistic picture, again, I highly endorse Bar Rescue. I am such a fan of that show. I, I, as far as I'm concerned, John Taffer is an Ameri- a true American. <laughs> he goes in there and starts yelling at them. Oh my God, I die. <laughs> my favorite thing about those kinds of shows are like, they they reach out to to the guys to come help them, and they're always like shocked about like, what? I'm I can't cook. I can't make drinks. Fuck you. Yeah, <laughs> like, dude. I <laughs> I saw one. I was dying laughing at his comment. Apparently, this one bar. T- failing bar right as is expected that's the point of the show um she had but she somehow had money for a personal assistant that worked at the fucking bar with her and um john taffer was like hey so what are you doing she's like a personal assistant and he goes he looks at him, he, goes, he looks at the bar and he's like you have a personal assistant but your bar is failing it's like i'm a millionaire and i don't even have a personal assistant and i was like oh <gasps> Burn! Holy shit! Jesus, what a what a sense of entitlement! That's amazing. I was like, "That's awesome!" Like, I have more money than you. I'm successful. I don't have fucking personal assistant. I do shit myself. <laughs> I think it'd be hilarious if after that episode he like fucking hired her. <laughs> now you're my personal assistant. I realized <laughs> it, I need it looked fun. <laughs> Ah, oh, God, yeah, I could talk about that show all day. I'd fucking love that show. It always kills me when I see um. There was a there was at least two episodes, two or three that they did on um Sixth Street in Austin, and all I could think was like, if you have a fucking for anyone who doesn't know, um, in Texas, in Austin, Texas, there's this Sixth Street. It's line just filled with bar after bar after bar after bar. Like college students, it's a tradition to go down there and bar hop and see if you can make it to the whole street. Um. So if you have a failing bar on that fucking street and you can't pull people in there guaranteed because they go there all the fucking time, you're bad. Yeah, if you're going to fail with that kind of prime real estate, you should not be in this business. No. <laughs> That's, I feel like it's, like it's harder to fail than it is to succeed in that scenario. Like you got to really like fuck this up yourself. You have to try. <laughs> Yeah, but moving away from that, uh, as always, like like I like to do before we go into production, this is your chance, Connor, and my chance in a way, to give me your honest opinion on Tom Cruise and his very lengthy career. Do you go gaga over the Tom Cruise? Radio gaga. <laughs> I do you feel like you want to be in his danger zone. Oh, my God. Uh I never really liked him at all. <laughs> um, I think Wish I had, like a hot take one so I could start pressing it. <laughs> hot take. Um, I I think he's a good actor. I think that he has his moments where he really excels. Films like Born on the Fourth of July and Magnolia, Tropic Thunder, um, a couple of the Mission Impossible movies. But overall, I think he is absolute slime. <laughs> I think he's a terrible human being who manipulates people, who uses people, who berates people, who lives on his own weird little cloud and thinks he's a god. And I can't stand him. I want to see him fail so hard. But as a performer, I think he's pretty good sometimes. But, you know, I've often... You know, I, I separate the men from their work, the actors from the performers uh, from the uh, performances, directors from their work. So 
I have no problem saying that, you know, some of his performances are really good, that some of his films are really good. But as a human being, if I ever met him, I'd spit in his face. He's, yeah. So that's, those are my thoughts on Tom Cruise. I mean, I'm not really far behind you on that one. So um, I'm very much, like I said, it, like, I know it gets tough sometimes if it's someone you actually do like as a performer when it gets the whole separating art from artists. Yeah. It does yeah. get tough. Um, I've, I know I've expressed it in the regards to like Marilyn Manson's music and how I was a really big fan of that growing up. I still am, but that's one that got tough because of uh, the allegations, kind of what he did for me when it comes to my taste in music. Yeah. Um, Tom Cruise, it's been a little less hard for me to really be. <laughs> it's real easy to separate because I'm with you. I do not like him as a person. I think when he first, and I'll get into it later, before Scientology took over, before his ego got the best of him, and he's just like up his ass so far, like no. he is now. I get why he was such a box office draw early in his career. The guy had charm, he had magnetism. Oh, yeah. This like, guy oozes and, charisma. It's, yeah, it's, it's like a superpower. City. Yeah, so I think like there was at some point a good Tom Cruise underneath all that, and then as Scientology took over, as his ego just got bigger, 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 and like you said, he never had a fucking bomb. Yeah, like, it just changed, and he's become this just he's, to me a piece of shit human being. Like he's a terrible outside of Scientology. Just the stuff you hear about, you know, obviously it's been resurfacing, or they've been bringing it back up because the movie's coming out this weekend. But how you treated sailors on the TR for the filming of Top Gun Maverick, I'm not going to go over it right now because I've said it like ad nauseum before in the past. Yeah. Um, how he, you know, even though he was trying to bury it, well, I, need, I want people to be safe for COVID. The way he talked to people to be safe was just rude, borderline. Like, dude, that's not okay how you go about it. Yeah, um, I hate. I hated the, um, a while back he did this interview with, I think it was um, Matt Lauer where he went off on psychiatry and medication and antidepressants and like really just condemned mental illness as like a personal problem that like, isn't something society should deal with. It's something that you have to deal with. And it was like, so out of left field cold. And I, I don't think enough people talk about that. His just blatant disregard for humanity. He doesn't give a mm -hmm. fuck about anybody. He's been trained and coached by the church to just, you know, live in a bubble. Uh, you know, like you said, you know, I'm sure at some point there was a decent human being in there, but you know, Zenu fucking ate his state and soul, and now he's gone. Right, he's gone. Um, <laughs> it, and that's why, like, I didn't mean to go, like, I know on that that ran with the left and right, but that was like the left and right that went up. So that's because, like, that was it was like a day where, like, uh, one of the podcasts I listened to, the movie Crypt, they made their little jokes about like people acting like the pandemic's over, ha, 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 and you know, having to get that fucking, which, like I said, I'm getting tired of hearing that on that particular side. Like, shut up. Yeah. Oh, no, one's like it's over. <laughs> yeah. no one's acting like it's over. We just got told we can try restrictions. Like, calm down. Um, but it's like that day that was said, and then I read about how he was just, he went on this whole thing at cons about how like, this is a this for Top Gun Maverick. This is a theater movie. It's not coming out on streaming. It, I would not let that happen. I'm just one of you guys. I love me. I'm like, dude, you delayed a film. Act like an asshole the whole time so people can see your precious movie in theaters. And instead of just seeing that, like, what it was when this was happening, which is the studios didn't want to sell in the movies, they had to release them. So they thought, hey. Let's do day and date so then people can still see these things. Now, with that, could the studio, I'll give actors and the directors this much, the studio should have been consulting with them for contract reasons before that. That was shitty on them to just say it and then be like, yeah, we don't want to talk about what we're going to do for you contract, right? It's like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> that part, and it's kind of like the whole thing that happened with, you know, Scarlett Johansson and, and um, Disney. Like, that was shitty on Disney to do that, absolutely. Um but it's like, dude, like you are so far gone from humanity here. Like, I it's like I want this from the bottom so bad. So people can be like, yeah, your movie's not going to save cinema, dude. Like, it's it's projected. Down. It's projected to make about like 180 million opening weekend. I know because it's people are the reviews are coming in. People are saying it's better than the first one. Blah blah. blah. I'm like, god damn it. Um, it yeah. So as a person, I I absolutely despise this motherfucker. 
but the he has picked movies I really fucking like, and I can't lie in that I am looking forward to the new Mission Impossible. I hate that the trailer came out just so in 2023. Like fuck you, I could have waited next year to get that trailer. Like fuck you. But um, am I looking forward to it? Yeah, absolutely. I, I actually really like the Mission Impossible movies. Um, I like to uh, live, die, repeat, edge, small, whatever the fuck you want to goddamn call it. <laughs> it was I was really entertained by that movie. Real quick, why the fuck did they do that? I don't know. It bugs me. <laughs> Edge of Tomorrow is the name of that movie. It's what it was, you know, it was called that by everybody. The trailer called it that. The poster did. The movie theater, I fucking saw it in, called it Edge of Tomorrow. And then they tried to backpedal that to live, die, repeat. Like when the DVD came out. And now there's this confusion. And I just like, ugh. I, yeah, I don't get it. I'm like, I like the movie. You just. I stopped worrying about the title. You had a good movie. Just call it what it is. Groundhog Day in Space. Yeah. It's actually, I think that's me that really made me start to uh, get into Emily Blunt more. I don't know what it was, but goddamn, for looking at that movie. I'm more uh, into his, dr- his drama than I am his action movies. I, I don't really like a lot of his action movies, but I really like his dramas. Yeah. Okay. Now that is a hot take. <laughs> No, I so there's one I've been wanting to watch because uh, even my mom who will not watch. Well, okay, before my parents pronounce her in rabbit hole, I don't want to get into it right now. Um, when they were watching movies, I'll put it that way, or when my mom was watching movies, uh, I do remember she would not she because she couldn't stand Tom Cruise, so she would not watch his movies like she hated him. But she would even say, like, Born on the Fourth of July was a great fucking movie. And that's been one I've been wanting to see. And she did she did say that. She's like, that's the one Tom Cruise movie I can watch because he was so good in that. Yeah, that's one of the best anti-war movies I've ever seen. It is so good. And also, you know, it's not just him. You know, Willem Dafoe kicks ass in that. It's got a great cast. Oliver Stone's message is loud and clear. Uh, yeah, that's a great watch. Yeah, so that, that, that's one on my radar. Um, I do wish, and I think and this is something else I've noticed um, with his career. What I like about his early career versus his newer shit is that he takes himself so serious now. Like, he does not want to be funny, whereas you watch his early stuff, he was willing to laugh, have a good time. Like, you, you could tell he wasn't taking himself serious. And I, and the reason I bring that up is because, like, one of my personal favorite films of his is Tropic Thunder, when he just went all in and had a good time. Like, why can't you just do that more often, man? Like, why do you have to take yourself so serious? Like, because when you commit to comedy... You were the highlight of an already funny movie. I don't care what people want to say about now and whatever problematic shit you want to bring about the goddamn movie. Um, I think it's hilarious, and to me, Tom Cruise is one of the best fucking parts about it. If, if you have a so like a social justice problem with Tropic Thunder, you miss the joke and you're an idiot. There it is. So. I said because there was a brief moment where I was hearing people would be like, "Oh, we need to bring Barbara Downey Jr. to us." I'm like, you missed the point of why he did that though. Yeah. Like he wasn't actually being he wasn't being racist. I get it. I know I get the history of blackface. I understand the history. I yeah. like, but he was making fun of method acting and that whole thing that actors are now getting called out on, actually, anyway. <laughs> he was making yeah. fun of that. Yeah, that movie mocks method acting. It mocks, you know, crazy control freak producers. It mocks the like the, the dark side of Hollywood. It's such a smart movie. I could, yeah, and it's funny as shit. Tropic Thunder is one of my favorite movies, uh, and Tom Cruise is a big part of that. He's so so funny as Les Grossman. It's wild how like, and a lot of that was his idea, like dancing the big fake fat hands. All that was Tom Cruise's idea. Yeah, I'm like, why can't we get him to do that more often? Because he was fucking outstanding. I was dying. Dragon, fa- dragon, fuck face. <laughs> <laughs> Who here's the key grip? You. Hit that director in the face really fucking hard. <laughs> it's, it's, oh god. <laughs> He's great. We do not negotiate with terrorists. <laughs> I will fuck your face. I'm talking scorched earth, motherfucker. Oh my god. That's the la- that's the hardest I've ever laughed in a movie theater. It was the first time I saw that. I had to get under. I had to get myself under control. <laughs> oh, uh, 
Yeah, but uh, you know, outside of that, he's he's a monster, and now he's you know he's got such a small pool of directors to pick from because so many people don't want to deal with his bullshit and his baggage. Mm. And that's just not good. I, I keep waiting for the bubble to pop, but with, you know, Maverick looking like it's going to be a huge hit, Dead Reckoning is probably going to explode. I don't know if it's ever going to happen. I, I Yeah, it's weird because like you said, it's like you don't really see him doing as much like original shit anymore. He's usually doing some kind of thing he's been tied to in the past, some kind of franchise thing. And it's like, like you said, he's working in a small pool of directors that have usually worked with him before that are willing to deal with them. Yep. And, you know, I guess let the actor take control, essentially direct. So that's what Tom Cruise likes to do with his movies more recently. Um, for, and if you don't think so, look up what happened to The Mummy. There was a good movie there at one point. Yeah, I was hoping that was going to... I thought the saving grace of that movie was at least it was going to damage him a little bit, but it didn't. No. I was like, God damn it. Um, but yeah, it's like, it's, it's really not happening. It's weird. And it's not like, to me, what's interesting is that like, I feel like I'm, I'm not trying to try a generational thing, but I do feel like it's boomers <laughs> that are holding on to Tom Cruise that they remember as a kid. Cause that's the only people I really know that go gaga over Cruise still. Yeah. And most people around my, our age group don't really have that same fondness for him. He's, He's a movie star and he's been a movie star as long as I can remember. And as long as like, you know, my parents can remember, he's just been one of those constants of Hollywood that seeing him as anything else doesn't feel right. And I, I kind of understand that, you know, this, you know, a lot of people don't like to let go of the past, but at some point, like how many Top Guns and Mission Impossibles and Edge of Tomorrow's are we going to get before people start saying no to Tom Cruise? Yeah, it, yeah, it, it's very interesting. He, he for lack of a better word, it's interesting figure in Hollywood nowadays. Um, and definitely the definition of I cannot stand this person, but I do watch some of his films because I'm like, oh, I, I did kind of like that one. He did do good in this. One. Like, he's not a bad actor still. Like he's still a good actor. Yeah, a terrible human being. That's me. That's just like between the Scientology taking over being a complete monster to work with, not taking taking himself way too seriously. Because after Tropic Thunder, I never saw him do a comedy again. I was like, really, man? Like, you were having oh. so much fun. Funnily enough, I think that his character in Cocktail is the closest we've ever seen to the real Tom Cruise on like in a movie. I feel like 80s Tom Cruise was had this guy's mentality, had this guy's drive, and this guy's lack of like fidelity. I just, I, it just feels like nobody but Tom Cruise could have played this prick. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I find that kind of funny. Yeah, this is true too. Yeah, Tom Cruise is, you know, he's a three, you know, three-time Oscar nominee who just stopped doing dramas because he got this, you know, weird stuntman death wish that he's been working with for the past twenty years. He had the need for speed. <laughs> Yes, he did. <laughs> but um, no, I, I just, I don't know. I feel like we will never understand what goes on in this guy's head because we've never been the leaders of a cult. So I don't, I don't know how, how you exist in that mindset and still do, like, I don't know why he's still doing movies. He could just go sit comfortably on his fucking throne with his dinner plate medallion and just let this, the church throw women at him. I don't know why he's still doing movies. <laughs> I, I don't know. He 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 is set until the day he dies. Yep. Ah, <laughs> uh, that I think that's enough on Tom Cruise. Yeah, at least in depth like that. Um, let's move on to development hell, which actually not as thank God it's not a superhero film, so it's not as in depth. <laughs> it's a little shorter, but some interesting stuff I picked up. So, starting off, this film is actually, I didn't even know it, so I probably was on paying attention to the credits, probably. It's based off a book. Yep. Um, a semi-autobiographical novel by Haywood Gold. I, I I hate hearing semi-autobiographical. I'm like, just either go all in or not. Yeah, either tell your story or make something up, but don't try to make yourself king of the fucking mountain when you weren't. 
<laughs> yeah. With that said, still love Eight Mile. Respect him and him. <laughs> I feel like he's earned it though. Did Tom like did this guy earn it? Haywood Gould. I, I don't know no. who he is. No. I mean, I'm absolutely earn it. And he, I mean, he got a he followed up by getting the Oscar for fucking the song for Christ's sakes. So yeah. he earned it and then did a surprise fucking performance like what two, three years ago at the Oscars? Mm-hmm. About then, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, he earned it. He's a rap god for Christ's sakes. Yeah. Um uh Gold worked as a bartender in New York from 1969 to 1981, quite a while. To help support his writing for at the time. So he was, you know, writing this book, bartending. So he was trying from a lot of personal experience. Uh, during this job, he would meet lots of interesting people behind the bar, and rarely it being someone who started out wanting to be a bartender, right? So, like any job, especially right, any job you've had, and you can apply this really to any job you've had in food service. And you know, if you worked at you know, like I worked at Subway briefly for a time before you know where I'm at now, you know. These kind of jobs that you kind of do to make ends meet, but you're not exactly hoping to make it a living. Um, and uh, as you said, me and these people, right, they all had their own ambitions. Like I was saying, right, you are having your ambitions, but some still smoldering as he worried it. So, you know, obviously some sort of that fire. They're very much like, no, I'm going to get out of the shop and get and do what I want to. Others, you know, we see time and again, completely forgotten or suppressed, right? They lose that hope. And they apparently stay in the CD ward of bartending for the rest of their lives. Oof. I I could say something, but I don't know who listens to this show. So I I will not. <laughs> I'm saying this like like not tr- <sighs> sarcastically, Jesus. Because it's just fine to me that they make it seem like this bartending ward is like this CD and stuff. I'm like, I don't think it's really that. Yeah. Like, I, mean, I feel like it's like any other job. You just go in, you make some drinks, you go home. These days, a lot of bartenders make more than a lot of teachers. So bartending is not exactly the dead end job it, it maybe used to be. These days, like you can actually live quite comfortably as a bartender. Yeah. So it's, it's just interesting to me, like how, how he set up this novel. That's why I include all this stuff. It's like you make this sound like this. these guys are like getting into drugs and like like going down a route of criminality or like prostitution. I'm like, that's not the case. We're just fucking bartenders. Like <laughs> this movie, like a good chunk of it at the beginning, like they're bartend. He's bartending at TGI Fridays. <laughs> like it's not, you know, it's not some dive in a back alley where all you can get is like cheap whiskey and a, and a fucking shotgun. Like that's not, <laughs> that's not yeah. what's going on here. <laughs> It's like any other job you have to make ends meet, and then if you liked it enough, you just kept doing it. Um, I, 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 yeah. Um, as for the lead character, uh, like any good writer, Gold made it a composite of a lot of people we met, including himself. Mm-hmm. Shocker for anyone that writes. Stephen King has done that for how many books now? <laughs> I just I. I find that a little hard to believe for cocktail. Like, did you go to Jamaica, hook up with a rich chick, and then another rich chick? And then bartending was a dangerous life back then. Okay. (laughs) You lived life on the edge. You were addicted to love. (laughs) (laughs) Jesus. Song has got out of my head since I listened to it watching the movie. (sighs) Well, luckily I have a quote to back that up. In his words, again, here's the quote. They are his words, not mine, people. I was in my late 30s. That's why I have to say that because I'm currently just in my late 20s. Let's calm down. As for him, I was in my late 30s, and I was shrinking pretty good, whatever the fuck that means, and I was starting to feel like I was missing the boat. The character in the book is an older guy who has been around and starting to feel he's pretty washed up, end quote. So he's he's Coughlin? Yes. Oh, I thought he was Tom Cruise. All right, I'll, nope. I'll buy that. I forgot that part. So apparently the studio wanted, I'll get to it, but the studio wanted a younger lead. He had actually ran it with uh, Cochran and Coughlin, what the fuck his name was, and as the lead. That would be a much better story. I would have watched it. Like, the idea of, like, you know, because that to me is, I, that's a more relatable story. The idea of, like, you're in a, a job and you didn't really want, you're stuck in it, and you start to feel washed up. Like, that's 
it, so many people go through that. That is much more relatable. Yeah, I take back everything I just said bad about Haywood Gould. I want to read this book. I want to see what his vision was before the studio said, like, this doesn't have enough Tom Cruise. <laughs> Look, we need someone that has a need for speed, that lives in the danger zone, <laughs> that wants to do impossible missions. You get goddamn Tom Cruise. About to be a lot of risky business on this set, if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> So I'll be some days of thunder. <laughs> oh my God. Were you born on the 4th of July? <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. 80s Tom Cruise. Was there anybody who, more on top of the world? I don't think so. You could actually say, I would say 80s and even 90s. He had a good, like, two, almost three, if you can do some early 2000s stuff, like, decade run there, where it's just, he was in everything. Was. Yeah. Damn. Huh. <laughs> if only, yeah. maybe if Cocktail had not been a huge hit, maybe. This is the <laughs> lunch. Room. This was the make it or break it film, was fucking like, Cocktail. I'm looking through his filmography, and I keep thinking, like, which one is the, the like, the crucial domino, where if this falls... We we're done with, with Tom Cruise. I would say between Risky Business, Top Gun, and Cocktail. If any of those had actually been complete bombs. I think in the 80s, Top Gun failed, he loses steam. In the 90s, maybe it's a comeback, maybe, but then like if Jerry Maguire or Mission Impossible fails, then we don't get 2000 Tom Cruise. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. There's a couple movies that he needed. That's true. He needed to show. He needed a movie where he had to show him the money. Yep. <laughs> he had us at hello. Well, most of us. <laughs> we saw we, through the bullshit. We completed him. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! All we wanted <sighs> was the truth. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> <laughs> oh Jesus. It's sad that as much we hate him as a person, we know his damn movies because it's he's, such a part of American culture. At he this is, point. he's such a fucking crucial part of pop culture DNA at this point that you can't escape him. No, <laughs> you have to, like, it's almost like, as like, you have to be like, and he's done so many types of films that at some point you're going to watch something he's been in, whether it's a trauma, an action film, a comedy, even his brief movie or two with horror, aka World of the Wars, for those who. Want to go down that route? I I don't recommend it. It's not a great movie. That is not a horror movie. But continue. It, it's it can be in it's adjacent. It can be in the horror genre. It's aliens invading and destroying Earth. I that does not make it a horror movie. That makes it a sci-fi movie. I will I will die on this. Sci-fi film. horror film. No, but yes. continue. Sci-fi horror film. Mm-hmm. Looking at his, what, did he do any real horror movies? Let's let's see. No, he's above that. Would you count the Mummy? Because I know Universal didn't. Unfortunately, I would. <laughs> so he's done sci-fi horror and action horror, but not true, you know, balls to the wall horror. Mm. So if you want to watch his allegations, I should say, of horror with sci-fi and action, yeah, Mummy and World of the Wars, but not either film's not that great in my opinion. He's fifty-nine years old. Scientology man keeps you young. Apparently, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> looking through i'm still looking for horror i'll get back to you. uh legend is the closest i can find i've heard people i've heard a lot of people actually legend is pretty good they, they're wrong it's not i don't know josh has the arrow i'm gonna have to give it a chance i didn't like it maybe, tim curry was awesome but maybe you're wrong <laughs> <laughs> I, I i didn't like it i thought it was boring but i like tim curry as the devil because that's that's a match made in heaven that's actually some reason I want to watch it. Oh, well, what, I guess Interview with a Vampire. Oh, fuck. Yeah, of course. There we go. I just forgot about it. Yeah, that's right. All right. So I guess would we count Legend? We, you know, fuck, Legend, Interview with a Vampire, World Awards, or Mummy. Take your pick there, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I want to say based off public opinion, the only one, well, Interview is the one that people like the most, and then Legend, and then the other two, and then World the Awards 50-50 with people. Um, for me, it was the ending. Actually, I was kind of on board until the fucking end of that movie. 
which I heard is how the book ends. I'm like, that's fucking stupid. Um, <laughs> and then the mummy is just utter trash. Yeah. Not, I am not referring to the 1999 cinematic masterpiece starring Brandon Fraser. That is flawless. Yeah. That is a, that is one of Connor's sacred 10. <laughs> yeah. That's a flawless film. That's where I have a meme. I keep meaning to fucking show you. That's really funny with that. Um, I'll see if I can find it after this. I got you. Is all it the right, one right. with Arwen from Lord of the Rings being like, looks like I got all the horses and all that? No, no, it's a like a text going on. I guess this guy gets like mad at his wife because he's she didn't want to watch the mummy and he's like, Have you not seen the 1999 cinematic masterpiece starring Brandon Fraser called <laughs> The Mummy? And then like the lady talks to you says something that clearly and he's like, and he goes. You clearly haven't seen the 1999 cinematic cast. We starring Brendan Fraser called the mummy. Apparently, that's a thing because I saw a bumper. I saw a meme that was a bumper sticker that said, "Like I'd rather be at home watching the 1999 cinematic masterpiece, The Mummy, starring Brendan Fraser." <laughs> like, I don't know when that happened, but I love it. I'm glad it's a great goddamn movie. Amazing movie. Ah. <sighs> All right. <laughs> so now that we know that you can at some point watch any genre of film that exists, and Tom Cruise has put his stamp on it for better or worse that's subjective <laughs> except that if it's his version of the mummy that's objective it was for worse yeah that's a fact try, try to tell me that movie's good and i will destroy you <laughs> on that note back to cocktail <laughs> so like yeah i just said right and i probably i forgot to include that yeah so the book was not the the would get changed when it got picked up. So Universal would be the first company to pick this film, uh, pick up the film rights. Notice I said first. Here we go. Um, they were the first ones to pick it up. Gold actually was brought on board to write the script, and he did change it from his novel. Um, so he himself said, "Hey, I want to change it. Elements of that would work, you know, better." Kind of like I'm. No one come at me because I know she's made some horrendous comments. But how J.K. Rowling was when it came to doing the movies of Harry Potter, if you will. I, I think Haywood Gould just, he, he was still after that million dollars. And this was this was his ticket. This is how he was going to get it. So he's like, all right, I'll do anything you want me to do. For the most part, he did. I'll get to it, but there was some fighting. Um, yes. Um, with that, so he was, he changed some stuff from his novel the project would actually get put into turnaround since he wasn't making the characters likable enough. So Universal was like, "We no one likes these characters, dude. We're not doing this. <laughs> I can see that. Yeah, I had trouble liking these people, even in the final really, draft. <laughs> yep, really hard. <laughs> but who would come by next? The corporation that wants to own every goddamn thing on planet Earth. And what Sony, you better watch the fuck out with Spider-Man if you keep your shit up. Disney would pick up the project um, because before they had now 20th Century Studio, they had this little project called Touchstone Pictures slash Brina Vista Home Entertainment. Mm. So for those of you like Tombstone, which is a wonderful film, you like a Disney movie. You're welcome. Yeah, Brian Flanagan's a Disney prince. There it is. <laughs> Billy the Kid. Disney. Oh. Doc Holiday, Disney. I'm your Huckleberry. <laughs> I love Tombstone. <laughs> Who doesn't love Tombstone? It's an awesome movie. <laughs> it is a really good movie, actually. I really like Tombstone. Um, <laughs> yeah, so Disney would pick it up, and essentially the same process would happen again. He would write, and he would fight with Disney. Um, one of the biggest fights would be over a certain thing like making the lead younger like I referred to earlier um, Gold was trying to be a stickler with no I want him to be older blah 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 and Disney was like yeah fuck that we want a young hot lead actor we gotta get butts in the seat buddy this is 80s Disney though they didn't have like I feel like you could have fought 80s Disney a little easier well, he didn't because he, 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 as we saw, he eventually gave into Disney's demands. Yeah. Well, sell out. Wow. What would, what would Coughlin do? Sell out. <laughs> he, 
he did some. <laughs> he, yeah, a lot. Yeah, so yeah, <laughs> Disney had their way, as they tend to do, even in the 80s. Um, Gold would later initially claim we'll get to some uh comments not adding up later, like a certain high profile trial. Um but okay. initially <laughs> gold would later would later go on and say that um the people he wanted to make these changes were correct. So he says at first. Well, he's got to sell this thing. He can't be the guy being like, Disney fucked up my movie. I'll go see it. Yeah, because I mean, like, like, I get it. It's, it's 80s Disney. It's not current Disney. But also, it's late 80s Disney. So at this point, they had their... They had probably just enough foul to be like, we're Disney. Don't don't you dare. Mm. Don't you dare say anything bad about this. I don't know. Little Mermaid hadn't come out yet. You seem to forget all the movies they had before that, though, that were Disney classics. Yeah, but in the 80s, they had a run of, like, failures. Yeah, but as have you, you clearly haven't learned shit about Disney. That didn't matter. No matter what, they had power. They have cradled the ball. They've had, no, I'm sorry. They've had Hollywood cradling their balls for decades. I was going to ask, like, whose balls are Disney cradling? What? They're, bo- they're cradling both. <laughs> Disney, though, does it, and it's not nearly as enticing. It's just like, okay, dude, let's do this, but really. Disney- Disney doesn't cradle. Disney squeezes, and then you say yes. That's how they. That's how they work. Yes. <laughs> so you can say what you want, but even in the eighties, they had that power because it's fucking Disney. Mm. They have always had that power. Don't you yeah. fucking deny it? I don't like that. But you're right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm right. You know, I'm right on this one. <laughs> uh. So with that, the search for a younger uh, lead. Would begin right, uh, and I actually had no information on if the, anyone else was considered. Eventually, they were cast Tom Cruise. That's all I had. There was no other information to find if they looked at anyone else, but mainly because he had expressed interest in the role, and somehow by getting him, they were able to get its financing. Because hey, Tom Cruise in the late eighties, like we kind of talked about, he was on a string of like box office hits. Yeah, you get him in your movie as your lead, we'll finance this because it's going to be a surefire hit. Oh, yeah. And as we see, you know, he could be in the shittiest production. It's still going to make money. It's going to make good money. And you yeah. know, in the 80s, $171 million, that's, that's a lot of money. It's a lot of, especially for its budget. It was a lot of money. Ooh, I did. I was able to find two actors who were considered before they went with Tom Cruise. Sure. Jim Carrey and Charlie Sheen. I can't see Jim Carrey, but I would. Charlie Sheen in the 80s would have been good in this. I feel like Charlie Sheen does not have to stretch the imagination to play an asshole. He's always has ti- he's has tiger blood in him all his life. He's been always winning, of course. <laughs> oh, I found more. Here we go. Keanu Reeves. I would have just just because I love him, I would have been down. Yeah, I, I I can never believe him like cheating on anybody though. No, he's and he does not like. I stand by. I had a running a recurring joke I would make with a buddy of mine. Like when I was stationed in Washington, is that like Kanye Reeves doesn't fuck. He makes love, sweet, soulful love to everyone. Yeah. He's been doing that to America his whole career. <laughs> I believe that. Uh, keeping it in the church, John Travolta. God. Uh, Rob Lowe. Tom Hank. Hmm? I'll say Rob Lowe in the 80s actually would have been a very interesting choice, I think. I think he could have pulled it off. This probably would yeah. have been a good a good vehicle for 80s Rob Lowe. Yeah. yeah. Hank's okay. not a chance in hell. He's too nice. Yeah, he's 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 America's dad now. Like I just don't see it. Get this. Steve Gutenberg. <laughs> uh Bill Murray. We've had a wildly different movie. <laughs> and Jeff Bridges. Maybe actually. Yeah. Hanks turned it down to do big and Murray turned it down to do Scrooged. So everybody wins here. Yeah. I will say wins that, you know, like, so and I look, I like big, I do, but I do get when people are like, I can't watch that film. Cause then I'm like, yeah, I get that. It is weird that like, they were like, yeah, let her sleep with them. And then he ages back to a kid. Mind you technically 
mentally when that happened he was still a child mentally yeah and now he gets to go to school and be like i banged a 30 year old woman yeah who's in charge now i know what a pussy feels like (laughs) doesn't she say something like look me up in a few years yeah and i'm like okay i saw i saw an image of uh like where the zoltar machine is like now it's a pepsi machine (laughs) it was just like a perfect like that's the final fucking nail in the 80s coffin right there. Zoltar's a Pepsi machine. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, but yeah, those were the guys who were almost Brian Flanagan. Okay. I think Tom Cruise is probably the best, but yeah, Tom and yeah, Tom Hanks, like I say America's dad. Are we are we ever going to just call him America's granddad eventually? Like he's when when's that change happening? He's been America's dad for a while now. <laughs> I feel like Keanu is America's dad now. He's reached that age. And Hanks, after playing Mr. Rogers, he's our granddad. I feel like, see, I feel like Karen Reeves is just a national treasure that America must protect at all times. Yeah, I agree with that. You cannot let him be hurt. No, he's he's the best. He'll be fine. I feel like the the country would riot if he was ever wronged. What'd you say about Keanu your Reeves? I saw a funny, like, fake article. It was a uh, numerous women accused Keanu Reeves of extremely appropriate behavior. <laughs> and I got really scared for a second. I was like, no. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, thank God. I actually heard, like, if you look at the pictures he takes, he never actually put touches. His hands are away. away. People, like, he hasn't actually confirmed why he does that. Some people think it's to avoid anything i was thinking it's because of his heritage it's like some kind of like greeting thing because you know he has like a whole lot of mixed uh heritage in his blood i'm gonna go ahead and assume he you know he's a very nice guy but he also does not want to get caught in any potential scandal so it's a smart way to do it it's a smart way to do it but yeah this is unfortunately not a movie that we can rave about Keanu Reeves. Hey, he does and, cocktail. We might not get Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. So I think it's a good trade off. It is because I really do like Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Damn. <sighs> Whoa. Uh, as for uh, Tom Cruise's older co star, because they didn't get rid of the older co star, older person completely. They just, he's not the primary focus. They would cast Brian Brown uh, based off his performance in the film FX. That's how they got him. Okay. He was just kind of, you know, there to just give him terrible advice. He was an asshole, and I'll get more into that later. (laughs) During our awards, I have some things to say about why you make why would you keep a friend like that? Yeah. Uh, Yeah, for sure. But yeah, he, I mean, actor's fine it's just yeah it's, this is a terrible character and it, I, I hope he wasn't like this in the book because then i'd be like yeah i don't care about this char- washed up character like let him be washed up he's a horrible person yeah this is what happens when you're a bartender who's constantly fucking your friends girlfriends you end up alone yeah no one likes you bud <laughs> <sighs> um the bottle tricks that we were talking about earlier believe it or not not in the book Apparently, Gold randomly showed both Cruz and Brown this, and they got so enamored they wanted to include it into the movie. You got to be really, really fucking careful what you show Tom Cruise on a set, because if he likes it, it's going in the movie, regardless of whether or not it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. He's done anything? That anything? You just like whip out your dick? He's like, that's impressive. We want it in the movie. How? <laughs> I damn that'd be a hell of a hell of a, a gamble to take, but it if it paid off. <laughs> What'd you do today at work? Show Tom Cruise my dick. Now I'm in the movie. <laughs> what did you do? <sighs> it's funny. What if like Tom Cruise just popped up? Thinking of dicks. What if Tom Cruise just like popped up in Jackass film randomly? I feel like they wouldn't give him a landing pad and like would drop him off a roof or something. <laughs> All the safety measures they put in place for the other slow they bring on board are like not for him. No, that'd be the perfect 
excuse to give him some like debilitating injury that just takes him out of commission forever. <laughs> what if it's like they're trying to be safe, but he's so demanding? He's like, no, I do my stunts. And they're like, you know what? Fuck it. Let me do it, guys. Let's see what happens. <laughs> they strap him to that rocket that like almost like the fuse almost like went up Johnny Knoxville's ass. But this time they, they position it so it does with Tom so- Cruise. <laughs> Ah! Hi, I'm Johnny Knoxville. Welcome to Jackass. That's how it starts. Now, Tom Cruise would insist that he does the introduction. Oh, God. He would Hi, take, I'm... Try to take that away. <laughs> Can you imagine how serious that'd be? Hi, I'm Tom Cruise. Welcome to Jackass. No, I'm not. I'm not I don't want to watch this movie, Tom. No one's laughing in the background. They're all just standing there, like kind of upset that he's doing this. Knoxville looks like he's going to murder him. We finally see a Knoxville angry for once. Bam runs up, does a Rocky. <laughs> Be worth it. Be absolutely worth the consequences. It would. He's just... <laughs> oh. God. Yeah. Now, one can dream. All right, well... <laughs> Uh, as now that all that's out of the way, I actually don't have much on the actual production from the way it sounds. It was just another Tom Cruise movie that got shot, went about its way. Kind of, I'll get to that again in a minute. There's some interesting comments made later. Um, I do have an interesting thing on post though. So, there was a score originally done by a, I'm, I'm gonna assume a miss. Sorry if I'm misgendering Maurice Gerard A. Gerard, J A R R E. I don't know how to say it. Maurice Gerard. Yeah. Gerard. Thank you. Um, originally done by this person. Yeah, that's a guy. Mister. I did miss Junior Rao. I'm going to get canceled in 2022 already. Um, it's okay. He's dead. Jesus. We're super canceled. Uh, I missed Mr. Maurice. Um, originally did the score. Uh, just, but. That's not the score you hear in the movie. Instead, a new one was done last minute. There's barely any score in this. It's mostly just random 80s tracks. Well, what you got was added last minute. So, Well, I I wonder why. (laughs) Also, getting into uh, some interesting comments. Kelly Lynch, who played the not happily married uh, Mrs. Coughlin in the film, uh, would later claim Disney reshot a third of the film, changing the story from being about the 80s and power and money to, in her words, flipping bottles. I highly doubt there was any substance to this thing from day one. So I don't I know. I point out, why do we hear about her a lot since then, since these comments have been made? I know the name. What I'm implying is that she said this and Disney was like, oh, we're going to blacklist the fuck out of you. Yeah, that was probably not a smart thing to do. Good luck working in this business. She, But she's got no real relevance to the plot. She's just Coughlin's like random hot rich girlfriend or wife he shows up with in Jamaica to piss off Tom Cruise. Yeah. Like, I get maybe she wanted a bigger, you know, significance in the film. Maybe, but blaming, if that's the case, blaming Disney is not the way to go because that will end for you pretty bad. Yeah, you don't fuck with the House of Mouse because they will fuck you back. Yeah, they will. Scary. Yes. <laughs> oh, as South Park showed us, uh, upon release, I, I love their take on Mickey Mouse, but I don't know. <laughs> Upon release, uh, the film, like I said, become a huge box office hit, the eighth highest grossing film of the year. God, standards used to be so low. Yeah. <laughs> Is it? I, I'll say this much. It's interesting because now most of the highest grossing film of the year are superhero films. I feel like at one point it was at least varied. Oh, yeah. You know, back in the day, a comedy or like, a you know, a rom-com or... What would, what would you call this? Dramedy? Drama. Or bad drama. Bad, yeah, bad dramas. They all had a chance. 
they could all make it into the into the box office top 10 of the year you know we only had like one batman movie every 10 years yeah now it's like if it's not super film, good luck it's, yeah it's kind of sad the market's been oversaturated i mean i'm still seeing all these movies but you know i'm also watching the bad dramas i'm trying to spread the love i will say I, I support the new releases I, I saw every, actually every, everything all at once. I found it was actually doing pretty stellar. It's like the little movie that could still doing really good. That's great. Makes me happy. Um, critically, though, different story. As we mentioned, it was reviled. Um, I, I usually don't bring it up because I, I think they're stupid anyway. I think they're as dumb as the Oscars. Um, the Razzies nominated for, I think, worst film of the year. I hate both the Razzies and the Oscars. So there you go. That's my feeling on the Razzies. I don't put a lot of stock in the Razzies because they nominated The Shining for worst film and like Jack Nicholson for worst performance. And I'm like, fuck you. So ever since then, I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. And then and then at first they were trying to they were trying to hold strong on the, the Bruce Willis thing just to get enough backlash. Go like, okay, okay, we're taking it away. It's it's in poor taste. It's like, yeah, no shit, it's in poor taste. Like the guy came out, it's been revealed why he's been doing the type of film work he's been doing. Yeah. Michael Bay doesn't have dementia. What's his excuse? Yeah, it's like <laughs> you're a Shamalon. Like, come on. <laughs> yeah, there's so many other bad filmmakers you could you could name that after. You can still keep it, just maybe don't go after the guy who's losing his mind. Yeah. She has a legit medical condition that will that is affecting his mental functions. Yeah. Pretty fucked up. Yeah. Um, and this is the last thing I have here. And this goes back to what I said about gold, right? Saying something different. Um, he would later claim that he actually was not happy with the final product. And Cruz has stated that this he does not consider this a crowning achievement in his career. His words, because it only something it can only be word like that coming out of his fucking mouth. Ah, uh, that's funny. Not 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 something simple like a like a, a regular term like hey not one of my best works no this is not a crowning achievement in my very successful career I'm Tom Cruise I would love if he ended every single sentence he said with I'm Tom Cruise <laughs> I feel like he he tried that at least once uh, I don't know just take take the W Tom you had a box office success. Some people kind of still like this movie. I'm sure bartenders watch this movie and laugh at the inaccuracies. Uh, take it. Or just vicariously live the life they want you through this film. I bet. Yeah, I bet there's a lot of like, God, I wish I was 1988 Tom Cruise. He did this the same year as Rain Man. So still, you know, good year for him. Yeah. Again, critics could hate it all they want. The dude was fucking somehow making box office gold every time, though. Unreal, man. All right. Well, that's all I got for um, development health. Unless you have anything else that we can move on to awards. Nope. All good. All right. Now for the awards, which are better than the Razzies because it's just two knuckleheads (laughs) giving out personal opinion. Ah, Two whippersnappers just doing our thing. Two jackasses. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> See what I did there. Uh, first up, Zack Snyder, or we like to call it the worst scene. Flip what I said. Your pick. <laughs> <laughs> um, this was interesting. Uh, this movie has really like three chunks. You know, there's the New York chunk, there's the Jamaica chunk, and then there's the soap opera chunk. And none of it goes well together. But I'll get into that later. But none of it goes well together. Sorry. Uh, I went with a scene from the first chunk. It's uh, Gina Gershon who keeps popping in on this show. <laughs> weirdly, uh, uh, I mean, look, I'm gonna say this real quick. I was really hoping we'd see her boobs again because I I think she was so hot, and <laughs> no, I didn't get that. And not even a good sex scene. I was like, "Fuck you, movie! You gave me well, nothing." That's my Go scene, on. the oh. sex scene, because it's they don't it's not, like they don't even fuck. They just freak out in the bed. Yeah. It, so off-putting and weird and i don't know what happened there or if that was like the third or fourth take and they were just tired of it but they're just freaking out under the covers and then we just move on yeah it oh, like i said i i i really have a thing for jenna gershon so i'm everything like oh okay i 
then when they cut to the scene and they're mad, I'm thinking, oh, okay, I, at the most I will get this will be my siblings. So I get to see a sex scene with Junior Gorshan. And no, I get this weird thing that I'm like, what the fuck are you two doing? Yeah. That was my reaction. Like, yeah, I'm like, don't don't tell me she was modest. She had bound, she has done fucking showgirls. I'm like, she had no issue showing off. It was just, I feel like they could have done that better. Uh yeah, it, it was just so weird. Um, yeah, there yeah. you go. You know, it's funny. I had this written down too at first. As soon as I was like, this is dumb. But I changed it to a part that happens in the in the third chunk, if you will. Because it never made for many reasons, I'll get into it. Basically, the entire climax of this film, as like just that whole scene that when he run the penthouse climax scene. Is what I put essentially because I thought it was so fucking stupid with him, you know, barging his way in there to profess his love in essentially the most undeveloped relationship I've seen. Like, there's nothing telling me that she should go with this guy. Um, and then we randomly get a plot line of you know her getting cut off from her wealth, which just kind of happens without any build up to that. So, like, this whole scene was just stupid, and then it gets really dark. You think for a second. Like something's going to happen to her baby because that whole security guard assaults her, and you're thinking, "Oh shit, it's going to get really serious." Also, and then it doesn't. Um, it's just this is a bad scene. It's just a terrible. Fuck. It, I rolled my eyes most of it. I was like, "This is stupid. I don't don't like this." And his apology, even though he was better than a, a certain other apology, we'll talk about. Um, still shitty. Still a terrible apology. Yeah, I've got. Something to say later about the apology. But um, yeah, that scene was weird. It was just like movies wrapping up with these two aren't together yet. So like let's let's just do it. And yeah, she she should have frankly like aborted the baby and moved on. Like this was a this is a doomed relationship that yeah, you know yeah. fucked I'm around not- on her on a dare and now is like, but I actually really love you. So let's do this. And she's like, no. He's like, yes. <laughs> and she's like, no. And he's like, yes. And then she's like, okay, fine. Like, that's kind of it. He just annoys her until she says yes. Yeah, I'm like, this is a little, like, like you said, it's an 80s liver shoot. I'm like, you can, you can find someone better. Like, look at you. Look at yeah. you. You're hot and you're rich. You're going to be fine. <laughs> yeah, you do not need Tom Cruise <laughs> in this, in this, this character he's playing at least yeah it was it was so weird. i was this is the first time i've ever been on the dad's side where i'm like yeah get rid of this guy yeah i, I was actually with the dad i'm like yeah cut them off they're both being fucking idiots <laughs> yeah good good pick good pick it was weird how the security was so willing to like just drag him out of there i would be like this is a family issue i'm i'm good but they're like get out of there get in the elevator like jesus man this is the penthouse <laughs> The butler like tried to force the door closed. Yeah, <laughs> there's no fighting in the war room. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this was yeah. This, I don't seem to me just the way this one comes out. This was in a different movie than what I'm watching. Is that's the best way to put it. Yeah. Um. Which now now but with that let's move on to our next one. The Ed Wood the worst line. I have three. There's some really bad dialogue in this movie. Oh, there is. Uh, my first one just made me laugh. Uh, it's the night where he's trying out bartending for the first time, and that one waitress is demanding a Cuba Libre. And he just freaks out and goes, you bitch, why didn't you just tell me it was a rum and coke? <laughs> I kind of agree with him in that. I'm like, yeah, why didn't you just say that? <laughs> so that's just kind of a gimme. And now... My other two lines are legit, like, who says that? Uh, my second line comes from uh, one of his co- very brief college scenes where he's in a business class and nodding off, and the professor goes, blue shirt, fifth row, wake up, screams it. And he just is like, okay, Jesus Christ. Like, I've, I've been in a lot of college courses. I've seen people sleeping. No professor would ever do that. Yeah, I've never in. I've been college college myself. I have fallen asleep myself in a college class. I have one teacher 
for my 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 sound in film class that the dude the way he talked was so he it was that droning ferris bueller uh teacher way of talking that it didn't matter how awake i was i was out like the dude was the boringest motherfucker to listen to talk because he droned and um never got yelled at i'd wake up when actually we we're getting ready to leave i'd be like i'm leaving and then i just leave i just hate especially in the 80s the way teachers are represented are always just such like tyrannical assholes who want to ruin your life and i don't like where did that fucking come from i don't know because really this whole teacher character is fucking horrendous he's a monster he's just telling people like like that one lady he berates because she wants to make like a cookie business and he he's like while she's not burning her husband's dinners she's like fucking with business i'm like dude yeah and i actually kind of agreed with tom cruise when he basically much said like you're the one that's a teacher dude like you're you, you obviously failed at your business yeah but it's just like this guy was written to be like so over the top asshole that it just wasn't believable and yeah i just was like what the fuck um yeah so that bothered me and then my third line is um during the initial apology when Brian uh, finds Jordan, goes to her apartment and tries to explain why he hooked up with this rich chick. And he says to her, you see, a guy lays down a dare. You got to take it. Like, that's his explanation. You know, what's funny. I had two lines. That was one of them. So we have the same. I just couldn't believe like who the fuck says that? (laughs) Yeah, I as soon as it came out of his mouth, I was like, did he really just try to say that as a fucking apology? I'm like, was that a thing in the 80s? Guess what? Any guy tries to make a bet with me, I don't give a fuck. I'm not taking it if I don't want to take it. I'm I'm 29 goddamn years old. Fuck off. This, like, it was 50 bucks. You ruined a perfectly good relationship on 50 bucks. You make 50 bucks in, like, 20 minutes. Yeah, it's like, dude, like, why... That was stupid. You had a perfectly good thing going. You that's why I remember the whole thing. I'm thinking, no, don't. And again, that's why I'm kind of glad we're seeing a lot more of like more realistic shit now that Hollywood's being called out more often by people with more recent films. Because realistically, no, you do not deserve to have her back. If you were that quick to just throw it all away on a stupid ass dare that you did not need to take. No, you like, don't deserve her, dude. Like this is your knight in shining armor. Like Jordan, this is this is your guy. This is your hero. Oh, good luck. Yeah, that's why I said like this marriage is gonna fail. Like, because all it's gonna take is one guy to lay down there. He's gonna be like, oh, well, I mean, I gotta take it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, yeah, that was one of the most ridiculous, absurd lines I've ever heard in a like you know trying to win the girl back scenario in a film. I was like, that's <laughs> goddamn. I hope you practice that in front of a mirror first. Yeah, that that was astonishing. I'm just like, no, that's that should have told her like, yeah, no, not getting back with this guy. If like that's how this whole thing and it was because he put a fucking he accepted the dare knowing he had a good thing going on with her. Because the fact that she came over meant there was talk for taking like what would have happened for her to be there, especially in the 80s when you didn't have fucking cell phones and stuff like you do now. There was talk then to be like, hey, this is when my shift in comes by and we'll go do something for the night. Well, and also the walk to the apartment, like he didn't bring up an apology there and saying it. Was that just a quiet walk home? Yeah, it's like, what the? F- <sighs> <sighs> yeah, I, God, this line just infuriated me. I was like, well, if, let me tell you. All any guys that listen to this, if there are any young men that listen to this, if you're pursuing a lady that you genuinely like, I don't mean just to fuck for the night and be done with you. I genuinely like, and you throw that away because your bro laid down a dare and you have this mindset of like, I have to take it to bet my manhood. You're a fucking idiot. You got some growing up to do. You're not getting that girl back. And I hope to God she doesn't, she doesn't accept the apology. Yeah, you don't deserve to go back, and I hope you, because you're a fucking moron. That's all. I, that's it. Grow the fuck up if that's the case. You're not Tom Cruise. You can't get away. You can't get away with that shit. It's not written. This is not a movie. You will not get it. <laughs> what was your other line? 
So my other line comes from my other character I didn't like, and it's his first. It's, it goes back to his first night on the job. Um, when he's talking to the his mentor buddy, I forget their names because I was half paying attention at this point already. Um, but he makes going and goes, oh, they didn't. This line that comes out of mouth. Well, you wait till you give them crabs, then you're really no hatred. I'm like, Jeez. I see. I was like, oh, these. T- uh, I had a moment. I was like, is this kind of dialogue I gotta get prepared for for the rest of this movie? Are you fucking serious right now? Is this our Obi Wan? Like, what the fuck? <laughs> this is this is the mentor. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, look again, guys. Do not be proud that you're so sexually active. You get an STD. Not that fucking great. You got to pay to get taken care of now. A lot of them are painful. So, and then if you spread it, because you will, you're just a jackass. Like, no, you're not cool. That is a weird thing to be proud of. Like, look at all these crabs I got. Oh. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what is it when, uh, if you're, what was it, behind the music with Metallica and they were talking about how much they got laid and they're like, everyone got crabs. So at some point, ha, ha, ha. Like, you guys are fucking idiots. Like your music. Don't get me wrong. Love Metallica. It's just, it's so weird what some people choose to like take as trophies. Yeah. And look, like, don't get me wrong. Like, you be as sexually active as you want. I don't give a shit. I know I do my fair share sleeping around, but I'm not going to be proud if I ever get an STD. I'm going to be like, shit, now I gotta go to the doctor. I got to hope it's something that I can get rid of because there are the few that exist that you can't get rid of. Um, You're going to go on Twitter and be like, herpes, I won. Winning. <laughs> herpes. Uh, hashtag Casanova. <laughs> I had a gore actually like legit uh, freak out on me. Quick side note. Um, uh, she was weird. We were doing like, we are doing the date and she on the first date straight up. How many, uh, what's your body count? I was like, oh my God, do not ask me that question. So I rounded down. Oh God. It's, I said like 10 or 5. I said someone like I, th- I thought was low at the age of like 27, 28. Not, not that long ago. That I thought was relatively low. Obviously not true. Um, and she like lost it. And then she's like, well, have you been like, have you gone to the doctor to make sure you've been tested for STDs? And I was like, Ugh. I'm thinking in my head, no. Because <laughs> nothing's felt weird down there. Everything's freaking fine. Um and she like legit, she's like, oh, yeah, that's a lie. I'm thinking, okay, you need to leave because this is weird. <laughs> like she, she was horrified at the thought of like that many I could be giving her an STD that I don't have. Well, shit. All right. Uh, I don't know. Back up what I'm saying essentially yeah. about like, don't be proud. That's why you don't be proud because in real life, they'll probably just freak out. Yeah, probably. Because no one wants an STD. <laughs> no. Nah. And- yeah, except for Coughlin, who's just very proud of it. He was very proud of those crabs. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's what the story, that was the moral story to go with, like, to back up. Why you shouldn't be proud like this guy. I have mixed feelings about that story, but I'm going to back you because you're my friend. Mixed feelings. I don't know where the mixed feelings land. I just get, I get why she'd be a bit, a little bit like, whoa, like, are you take are you being careful about it? Like I get why she I was. I was too. I told her that. As long as you told, as long as you were, you were like, yeah, like I'm careful. And then she was still like, oh my god. Then okay. I told her. I was careful. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. I'm saying I, I'm not saying I don't understand. I'm just saying like I get. I'm saying it more to support why you should not be proud. <laughs> if you have an SD, I don't. But if you do, don't be proud. You're giving it to people. Of course, they're going to hate you. I had a, I got, I got a sidebar here. I got to be careful about who I name in this story. I just want to use names. A friend of a friend of a friend. Uh, knew a girl who had, I think it was her, I think it was herpes. And then he slept with her, then got herpes, and then was pissed at her for giving him herpes. And I, when like I was hearing the story, I'm like, you knew she had her. Like she told you, like how is this her fault? If you knew, right, it was if she, you. Yeah, if she's that a friend about, then that's on you. 
Yeah. So I know if, if I've been telling you, like, then hey, sorry, I'm not, I'm not doing the next. I do not want herpes. Yeah, but I was just yeah. like, you fucking moron. Like, I was thinking, like, this is your fault. What are you complaining about? Yeah, you did this. You did this to yourself. <laughs> you made your bed. Now fucking it. Yeah. So more of all these stories is don't be like this guy and be proud that you had crabs and you gave it to them and then they hated you for it. Have safe sex. Get tested regularly. Or if something just feels funny down there. Um, I get I get the the weirdness of wanting to do it regularly. It's a it's kind of weird. Like, hey, I want to have you guys look at my dick and test it for STD. It's awkward. Um, but well, just word it like that. Yeah, hey, look at my dick. It's not how you supposed to word. Just just pull your pants down. Look at it, um, sir. This is a dentist. <laughs> what I mean is, yes, in real life, be safe when you're having sex. Do not be proud because in real life they will fucking hate you and you will probably hate them if you're on the flip side of it. Let's just be honest. Yeah. Crabs sucks. There's the moral. <laughs> yes. Don't get crabs or any STD. Uh, speaking of STDs, so Steven Seagal. <laughs> Allegedly. Got to make sure we say that. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> if herpes was a person. Worst right. performance. Um, this was this was actually kind of tough. I do think Tom Cruise and Elizabeth Shue are trying here. I do think they are both pretty good. Uh, yeah, yeah. I went with Brian Brown as Coughlin. Hey, we have overlap again. So I went with Brian Brown also. I I think he's a terrible character. I think he's a terrible friend. I think he's a terrible mentor. And I think the performance is stilted, one dimensional, and monotonous in his delivery. I. So I I see I, I agree with you and like the character. I think his performance is fine. Like I see why they picked him, but it's just like it's buried on it's just a terrible character that this movie tries it seems to try hard for you to like that, which is the weird part. It's not like the movie's going out to be like, hey, here's a terrible character, and this is why you should hate him, right? They're like, No, you we want you to like him. I'm like, Well, I don't. He's fucking horrendous. So like he's he literally slept with his best friend's lady to get his money back. Yeah, Jesus Christ. And then told him about it like he was going to be like, ah, you got me. (laughs) Yeah, I'm like, that's just shitty. That's not a friend. That's shitty. Um, And then is the one that does the fucking bet, ruining the other, helping do his part, ruining their relationship. So, like, he's obviously, he's terrible because he's pulling that move of, like, oh, no, I want my buddy with me at all times. He can't be happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I never... And the constant having to tell people I'm his I'm his mentor. I tell him everything. And I was like, that breaks less of you trying to like you're proud and that you're that desperate. I did think though in the letter he left him at the end that like that's how he Tom Cruise was gonna get his million dollars. I was I was thinking that for a second, but then it was more like a hey, turns out my life sucked. See you in the next one. Yep, my life sucked, believe it or not. You're my only friend, which I don't fucking believe because you're shitty. You would not have been my friend. Apparently, there was a bit cut from the script where um, on the yacht, Coughlin revealed that he tried to fuck Jordan. And that's why Tom Cruise was so willing to go up to the penthouse with his wife. Because he was going to be like, fuck you. I always hated you. We're not friends. Then he was going to leave, come back, and he was going to be dead. So there, a lot, there's going to be a lot more guilt there. So... Even in the end, he was just a fucking horrible person. 80s, cocaine and sex. That's all I got. And a lot of art that gets destroyed by Tom Cruise shoving people into it. I was actually kind of satisfied on that one. I'm not going to lie. Twice. I, it happened twice. <laughs> look, if there's anything worse in this world than academics, um, it's the art, the snobbish art world people that think they're so much fucking better and laugh openly in front of you like that guy in the movie. So when I see characters like that get their shit destroyed and have that moment, I'm like, oh, thank you. Fucking thank you. Down boy. Like, oh, my God. Oh, uh, I, I, I would have punched him on that. Oh. I, did, I did think it was interesting that we established that Tom Cruise's character is a soldier, and then it never comes up again. Ever. It's... And then there's like a random scene in the being where he is holding a baby on the bus. Yeah. And I'm weird. like, 
Yeah, I'm thinking like, oh, okay, he has a wife and kid, and nothing's ever mentioned of it. He just picked up a stranger's baby because I the '80s, and I guess you know, stranger danger wasn't. Well, I mean, to be fair, where's where's he gonna go? It's a bus. <laughs> to be fair, I don't give shit. You're not grabbing my baby on a bus. I'm not saying Fuck it's a, you, a good idea. Man. I'm just saying. It's not like he's going to run off with the baby. He's on a bus and on a window seat. He's going nowhere. You grab my baby on a bus. I'm raping you on that bus. Okay. Since we can't go anywhere. Jesus Christ. Oh. She probably like they were talking on the bus and like getting to know each other. And she probably handed him the baby. He's like, you want to hold my baby? And he's like, sure. I doubt he's just weird. like, give me that baby. Still weird. Why would you do that? It's a bus. It's a strange man on the bus. Where were his friends at the beginning, his army pals who were like driving him to the bus while the bus was going and were like, you know, way to seek your fortune in New York, man. Like, you know, good luck. Who are those great friends of his we never see again? That or his like his family that he goes to visit, his uncle and stuff that you literally don't see again to the end of the movie. He gave up on college really quick. <laughs> he's, he's a quitter. Which leads uh, this actually all leads to my 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 uh my thing for the Michael Bay. So I'll get to I'll just stay quiet for now, but I will get to that because it leads to a big my big Michael Bay moment. Um but with that, let's go ahead and do your Michael Bay. Uh we're still making decision. Um so I went with the insane level of coincidence in this movie. All right. Tom Cruise from New York goes to Jamaica. Apparently, there's only one bar and one beach in Jamaica because I've been to Jamaica. It's a big place. And um, he meets Jordan, who is also from New York and goes to a rest, like works at a restaurant Tom Cruise is familiar with. Then he hooks up with his rich chick, also from New York, who has a business in like on Wall Street. Like, are the only two places that exist in this world, New York and Jamaica? Yes. I was just like everybody he met, and then Coughlin ends up at his bar. I, it's just, it's too much coincidence to take. It's ridiculous. It's, I mean, yeah. make Jordan from like Chicago or some somewhere else. Why does it all have to be? Or just an not app? have that whole Jamaica thing that kind of felt weird. Anyway, <laughs> it really did. It felt weird and forced. A lot of white people in Jamaica didn't know that. Different from the experience I had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's weird we we don't need to go to jamaica the, the, the second half of this movie could take place in like brooklyn <laughs> yes and you know what i'll go on this is a good segue to like my points so we kind of talk about this whole thing right now and just have a nice big discussion here yeah because for mine i put the film brings in a lot of major plot points which never mesh well tonally with the story being told so there's a very disjointed structure to this film i agree for me and that's what i put like this is the most disjointed fucking movie and kind of like why and that's why i said i'll go ahead and say because it really lines up what we're talking about and why i feel this way about the film so yeah it's just like shit kind of happens and it's like doesn't really work in context of what you're telling me no it's just because tom cruise is here you just assume he can do anything and he can go anywhere and you just roll with it but there's so much in this film that shouldn't happen and wouldn't happen to normal people. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's a weird. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm not going to, I'm not going to somehow go to Jamaica after assaulting someone, and my coworker. <laughs> yeah. That was very much just like, fuck you. And now we're in Jamaica. <laughs> yeah. There was no, how did you get the money to go to Jamaica? How did this happen? How did you get your own bar in Jamaica so quickly? Yeah, the whole point was that you didn't have money. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I get that. Yeah, this. I, I wonder how much of that was Gould and how much of that was Disney changing things to make Tom Cruise basically an unbeatable god in this movie. I am Disney, a golden god. He fails at nothing. Like Everything he tries to do, he succeeds amazingly. Well, what's crazy is that what he does fall, he recovers with just a smile, that Tom Cruise smile. <sighs> yeah, she even, uh, Elizabeth Shue says that at one point, like, you can't smile your way out of this one. Like, yeah, he can. 
and he did. He, he's been doing it the whole movie. <laughs> ah, yeah. Well done. Yeah. Um. <laughs> all right. Let's let's somehow flip this and talk about our server linings. What's the one positive that you had? I really, really liked the scene where Brian punched Coughlin. That that's my silver line. That scene where Coughlin just casually like, yeah, I fucked your girl. Now you owe me money. Ha <laughs> ha, I win. And Brian's like, why would you do that? Like he's so hurt. And Coughlin's not picking up on it. And Brian just knocks his ass down. And immediately the music stops. Everybody's like, oh, I'm not getting my drink tonight. <laughs> And I mean, were you going to get your train tonight? I never see people get trains. Just shit flipped around. But yeah, go on. A lot. Yeah, I got that in my. Uh, I got that in the box in a bit here. <laughs> that was a big problem people have with this movie. Like, where are the fucking drinks? But um, yeah. And Coughlin gets up and he's like, "No fighting in the bar. That includes the help." And he like points a broken bottle at Tom Cruise and he's like, well, "I don't work here anymore." He's like, "Come on!" Like, it's the first real moment in the movie where you feel like, "Oh, consequences," and. I wish that had led to more, but then Coughlin just never brings it up again, never apologizes for it, is never just like, he just acts like it didn't happen. But he, there's clearly still resentment there or he wouldn't be there trying to fuck up Tom Cruise's life even further. Yeah, there had to be. And the whole thing was shitty. Like, like they, they openly kiss in front of him, but her eyes wide open staring at him. Like, she's doing it to piss him off. And then she says that shitty comment. Why would, but why did she have such anger towards Tom Cruise? Because he said something about like their sex life. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't get it. Cause I'm like, he didn't make a bet or anything. Like, what, what do you mean? And then, yeah, cause she was like, you shouldn't have said about sex. I'm like, do you not know guys? I was like, you don't tell me you don't tell your fucking girl. I know for a fact women tell their fucking female friends everything about what their first time with the new boy boyfriend was like. When also, what did he say? Like, all we saw was them playing basketball where Coughlin's like, she's going to fuck around on you. She's a gold digger. And Cruz is like, no, she's a good person. She wouldn't do that to me. Like, he's yeah. defending her. Yeah, it's like he's the – so, which then tells me that more likely Coughlin fucking lied his ass off. Yep. But what was said, so it's like, dude, again, why did you even forgive this guy or just resume your friendship? Because he clearly lied about what the fuck was said based off context of what we saw was actually said and how she acted. Mm -hmm. and, well, I like that scene. Cause it's, you know, Brian standing up for himself and. Oh, top of cough. It's like, you're going to thank me for this one day. And he just goes, the fuck I will. And walks out. I'm like, yeah. And I was hoping like, I want to see where that movie progresses, but then we're in Jamaica and you know, nothing changed. Nothing. He just comes in and they just act like it never happened. I was like, Oh God damn it. Yeah. So it was a tease of a bigger, better movie. And yeah. Of, yeah. Of the darker film we should have probably gone, honestly. Uh, for mine, I did, I like I, I mentioned it earlier, and I just put it the sheer charisma and magnetism of Tom Cruise. Like I said, like I said earlier, before he was a, a monster, a dick, a prick, whatever you want to call him to work with, before Scientology really got his fucking hands on him, like clawed deep into him. He was a young actor who could charm an audience with a smile. And I solely believe his charisma, his charm was the main reason he had such huge hits. Like that, that kind of magnetism was box office success, as we saw to this day, technically, for people at this time. It was gold. It was gold. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah, this is, you know. If I go back in time and grab 80s Tom Cruise and bring him here so he never encounters the church, I would do it. Because <laughs> I would love to see what Tom Cruise would be like today if he'd never gotten tangled up in that fucking mess. Oh, yeah. I think most people would not at this point. Yeah. Ah, what a waste. I'd save Travolta, too. <laughs> yeah. God. That's a story for another day. I'd love to live in a world where we don't have a Battlefield Earth movie. Or Travolta having constant career killers slash resurgences. I feel like that would still happen. But we wouldn't have Battlefield Earth. Something else would have fucked that. I was like, I think we still would have had Battlefield Earth just without Scientology involved. That would be weird. If he just stumbles onto this L. Ron Hubbard novel. It's like, this is pretty good. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well, 
that's all I got for mine. And with that, let's move on to the next segment that will hopefully be be interesting. I because I haven't seen these, but let's find out what's in the box. What's in the fucking box? This film is pretty hated. Uh, a lot of shit on Tom Cruise. A lot of random like this made no sense moments. One of them I thought was really funny, but then you know it was revealed that uh, Elizabeth Shue was was rich, so it made more sense. But somebody. One of the posts was, uh, how long was she on vacation? <laughs> yeah, but then I was like, she's rich. She can be on vacation as long as she wants to. She can literally just live the rest of her life on vacation. I don't Until know she gets married to Tom Cruise. Now she cannot do that. If anything, she's <laughs> lost a lot more than he has. Um, but like, why is she working on a, in a diner? She doesn't need to do that. Yeah, that, yeah. that was crazy to me. I'm like, cause especially because like, she wasn't cut off then. Like she was getting the money. Dad expressed all interest in being able to just keep giving her money. So I'm like, you're you're choosing to work when you don't have to. And don't give me the whole, you know, she wants to be independent, make her own way in life shit, because she's in Jamaica indefinitely, which she didn't pay for with tips. Exactly. So. And I'm sorry if I was a child of a rich kid and I, even I wanted the whole like I want to make it my own way, I'm not doing it being a fucking waiter. Fuck okay. that. I am finding at least a decent enough job because guess what? Use your, like, I'm going to say right now, sometimes, every so often, advantage is a good thing. Yeah. A, a nice leg up it can be good. And, and in a case like that, if you're growing a wealthy family, I understand if you want to not, you want to earn your own money, that's fine. Take advantage and get yourself a decent job. Go, just just do it. Don't you, you have that over me? Do it. I'm not jealous. <laughs> well, I just I thought that was funny, but I decided not to include it because I'm like, well, she's rich, that's why. But uh, I do have five good ones for you. This has a 2.7 out of five on Letterboxd, which isn't that bad compared to what we've looked at in the past. Uh, the only thing that hit three so far is Showgirls, which still baffles me. What following shrug of that one. <laughs> uh, so here are five hilarious letterbox reviews. Number one, this is from Matthew Newton. The alcoholic in me was getting stressed out with how long it took for Cruz to make a drink. Two stars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point. He flipped a lot of bottles, made like three drinks. Yeah. I would have been if I was at the bar and he was doing his stupid little like turning the music off to have the car go away. Do 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 do. I'd be like, stop and make my drink. I'm right. Just give me my drink. I, I ordered a Jack and Coke. What is taking so long? Did you mean a Cuba Libre? That's a rum and Coke dipshit. Yeah, I'd be like that dude from SpongeBob who got his pizza, but not his drink. He just freaks out. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, this is from Sarah Castle. Tom Cruise is like if capitalism was an actor. Four stars. <laughs> I like that. Good. Okay. Very much all like, I got to make that million. I got to get a good job. Like, I got to be a bartender. He's very much got a capitalist mindset from beginning to end. He does. Great. He even turns down the money. Yeah. Which is weird. At the end, he's like, love over capitalism. That sounds like something a communist would say. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Or laugh. He just him. He just also puts the salad over. Show me the money. <laughs> uh, this next one's from Kip Bauscher. This was so, this was so shit. I forgot I watched it. Two stars. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen some bad films. I haven't had that happen. <laughs> yeah, I've never watched a movie and be like, I I've seen this before and I hated it. I can't imagine what that feels like. I wonder how long it take. Like, how long is the film? We were like, wait a minute. I guess if you watched it in the '80s and you were like, you know, three, like, you know, three or four hours deep in an eight ball, I wouldn't remember it. Uh, this one's from Nosferatu Reese. I am admit- concerning. I literally watched Seventy Nights Nosferatu right after this. I know that's why I was like, oh, I got to put this one in there. 
I immediately spilt the drink right after this movie. Fuck you, Tom. Three stars. <laughs> he wasn't flipping. He wasn't flipping right. Um, <laughs> and this last one was just perfect considering what we've been talking about. This is from Pete Cook. I like the bit where Tom Cruise suffers absolutely no consequences for his actions and learns absolutely nothing. One star. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. No, instead he somehow gets to go to get married and uh, he's having twins. I'm like, none of this should be happening for this man right now. No, this man should have gone back to Jamaica and been depressed. It should have ended with him basically on his way to becoming Coughlin. He should have died. We should have seen him commit suicide and end there. Shit. She should have killed him for ruining, trying Auto, to ruin her. Auto erotic asphyxiation is how this should have ended. Jesus. That is ambitious. I've seen that in one movie. Uh, 2009's World's Greatest Dad. You ever see that? No. That is a downer, but also really funny. It's uh, Bobcat Goldthwait. It stars Robin Williams as a dad who's a teacher who's a failed writer. And his son is uh, the, the, the boy from Spy Kids. And he is an absolute cantankerous shit. Everybody hates him. He's this dick. He hits on all the ladies. Everyone despises this kid. Well, one day Robin Williams finds him dead in his bedroom from autoerotic asphyxiation. And he did he doesn't want to like, you know, he's super depressed. His son's dead, but also he doesn't want he doesn't want people to know that his son's died. His son died like this. So he makes up a suicide note that becomes a hit. Like people are like, wow, it's so beautifully written. This kid was so tortured. We didn't, we misjudged him. So now Robin Williams, he's an opportunity to get that writing career off the ground. So he writes a fake journal in his son's name. And it just gets wildly out of hand. It's a, it's a wild movie. Okay. Yeah. Depressing as hell at times, but also really funny. There's a part where he says, like, I've got a date coming over. And if you make, if you make a fool of me, I'll stab you in the face. Like he says that to his son. <laughs> so it, I recommend it. Anyway, yeah, that made me think of that. Okay, I was not expecting that to happen. <laughs> is that all that's in the box? That is all that is in the box. Well, with that, let's just close the door. For now, Tom Cruise. Not the last time, though. There's still a couple of films I can't, that will be visited on here one, one day. He'll be back. He will definitely be back. He's like her. Can't get rid of him. <laughs> you can try. You can think he's gone, but he's going to flare up again, and then you're going to have to deal with him. <laughs> he's going to ruin some relationships. It's, just, it's what he does. Before I reveal next week's episode, social media stuff. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram under Filmgasm Productions. Uh, if you want to shoot us a recommendation, uh, feel free to email us at filmgasm at gmail.com. Uh, if you'd like to donate and support in any way, you can find us on Anchor. And then finally, you can get, we have a website that you can get on called filmgasm.com for reviews, for those articles, and all of our episodes get posted up there. Um, next week, we'll be taking a look at at an all-time favorite director of ours, but a film in his later career missteps, if you will. John Carpenter's, and yes, this film does have that on the DVD. John Carpenter's, I think it's on Blu-ray. Don't don't quote me. I I had the DVD copy because it was a free copy, and then I got rid of it. But moving on, <laughs> John Carpenter's Ghost of Mars. Yeah, this is uh it's been a minute since I watched this one, but if you watch all of Carpenter's movies in order from Dark Star to The Ward, you can really see a decline and it's really sad. But yeah. Ghosts of Mars is a special kind of decline because this was supposed to be a great movie, but the studio fucked it. So he said, Well, if I'm not gonna get to make Escape from New York three, then nobody's gonna like this. <laughs> so I'm, I'm excited all, to talk about this next week. You're all going down with me. Basically, yeah. If I can't fuck Natasha Henstridge, I'm not making a good movie. 
Anyway. On film gasm. <laughs> Colson, if you guys remember him, it's been a bit. Uh, he'll be making his long awaited return to talk about the cult horror film The Void. Uh, that he picked through a really funny story I heard before we recorded. <laughs> God bless you, Colton. <laughs> <laughs> at least I know somebody's looking at the reviews. <laughs> the fact that he wanted to do one movie and then it's like, oh, well, it's on. They, they reviewed it. I mean, we did it. It's like, no, actually, no, it doesn't. It's actually the opposite. Like, when we do episodes and it's like a film, especially when I'm now that we're doing what we're doing i should have time to do it again but when um i'm seeing like if i need to write a review on the episode or not and i look i'll say i'm like oh i already wrote a review do i i then it's a do i agree with what i wrote and i go feeling still stands score still stands sweet not writing shit what happens to me a lot is i'll watch a movie and then sometimes my thoughts will change but then i'll be like i don't want to fucking write it again i'm just nah i don't, yeah, like, oh, don't want to yeah, I'm sure I still agree with most of this. Yeah, and even if like my score changes, if my points still stand, I'm just be like, oh, I'll just have Connor change the score when we do that episode. It's fine. I've changed scores without changing the review, and things are wildly inconsistent, but I don't care. <laughs> <sighs> On that note, I still look forward to the void. I've heard a lot of crazy things about this film, so I am looking forward. Uh, to hearing it, and it's going to probably be the kick in my butt to actually finally watch it because I have not seen it myself. So I'm um, looking forward to hearing you guys talk about it and what you think of it based off what I've heard about it. So, um, on Oscar Sunday, that will be looking at a more highly regarded new and Austin Tom Cruise film. So he will he will get at least the film love that one could say he deserves with 1999's Magnolia. Yeah, this is a, a film where I do think he is incredible in. So if, if I, may, I may contradict my, my thoughts on Tom Cruise on that episode with this episode, but just, you know, I, I, I think he's a bad person, but a good actor. Let's just, that's my, it's my base thoughts on Tom Cruise. So whatever I say in Oscar Sunday is going to probably not conflict with that. Well, if you just sit there and go, I'm like, he's a god, he's the best, he's a gift to this earth. Like, you just start ranting. I just start quoting like L. Ron Hubbard's books. <laughs> like, oh shit, they got him. <laughs> god damn it. I am clear. Like, no. <laughs> I have seen the light. <laughs> no, that would be quite a twist. But I know like Magnolia is Austin's favorite movie of all time. I get it. It's an amazing script, really um, incredible performances. It's a great movie. So I am looking forward to doing it. Uh, but, you know, it's funny going to be, you know, shitting on Tom Cruise, praising him back to back is going to be interesting for me. <laughs> yeah. Best part is because we got rid of uh, uh, Oscar Sunday. We did not get rid of Oscar Sunday. After I just told you what's on the new episode. After now we've decided not to do sneak preview. We don't have to then now have the 50 50 thing going on of like, well, shit, now there's Top Gun Maverick coming out, you know? Yeah. I'm just actively yeah. avoiding that movie personally. I'm proud of our of our sneak preview output, but I all, all I am also like relieved and looking forward to not having to deal with it. Oh, yeah. 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 Now I don't have to, you know, sit doing our fucking Hercule Perot film. Yeah. See, that was a big, that was one of them where I'm like, yeah, that wasn't. Anyway. We're not dropping them from the feed or anything. It's still our fourth show. We still did it. It's still going to be there if you guys want to go back and listen to the past, you know, year and a half uh, in film. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. But until then, God, the segues today are great. <laughs> until then, if you decide to bartend, as we learned in this movie, maybe pick your mentor out better. So one, you have a good friendship. And you get a more stable career. You're not having to go to Jamaica and then back to your city and only your city. And with that, see you next week on Beyond the Bad.